The laughter and chatter around the table were abruptly cut short, replaced by a stunned silence that seemed to amplify the sound of beer dripping from, from my hair onto the floor. Tristan, my husband, stood opposite me, the empty beer can still in his hand, a smug grin fading from his face as he realized the gravity of what he'd just done. Meredith, I swear, it was just a joke. Tristan tried to defend himself, but the stern look on his father, Douglas's face, suggested this was no laughing matter. A joke? I echoed, my voice steady but seething with anger. Is this what our marriage has come to? Your idea of fun? Eliza, calm down, Meredith interjected, her tone dismissive, as if soaking your wife in beer was a trivial matter. Boys will be boys. That's enough! Douglas's voice boomed, slicing through the tension like a knife. Tristan, apologize to Eliza. Now. Tristan's jaw clenched, and for a moment, I saw a flash of the man I thought I married, a man capable of respect, of love. But it vanished as quickly as it appeared, replaced by a scowl directed not at me, but at his father. I'm sorry, Eliza, he mumbled, the words empty, devoid of sincerity. The room fell into an uneasy silence, the incident laying bare the fractures within our family. Once, I had been a confident, independent woman— but now, living under Meredith and Douglas's roof, I felt like a shadow of my former self, trapped in a cycle of disrespect and enabling behavior. As the evening wore on, the incident with Tristan was glossed over, but the damage lingered, a stark reminder of the growing gulf between us. It wasn't just about the beer or the humiliation. It was about respect, about partnership. And as I lay in bed that night, beside a man who felt more like a stranger with each passing day, I wondered how we had gotten here, how I had allowed myself to become so lost. Douglas's reprimand of Tristan was a small spark in the darkness, a sign that not all was lost, that perhaps there was still hope for change. But as I drifted off to sleep, the laughter and mockery echoing in my mind, I realized that hope was a fragile thing, easily extinguished by the harsh reality of our lives. The next morning, I awoke to the sound of Douglas and Meredith arguing in hushed tones in the kitchen. He needs to grow up, Meredith. We can't keep coddling him. Douglas insisted. He's our son, Douglas. He's just going through a rough patch, Meredith countered, her voice laced with the same denial that had enabled Tristan's behavior for years. Listening to them, I felt a surge of determination. This was not the life I had envisioned for myself, not the partnership I had signed up for. It was time to make a change, to find my way back to the strong, independent woman I once was. But as I stood at the crossroads of my life, the path forward uncertain, I knew it would not be easy. The bonds of family, of marriage, were not easily broken, and the journey ahead promised to be fraught with challenges. Yet, in that moment as I resolved to reclaim my life, I felt a spark of hope ignite within me. A spark that would, in time, become a blazing fire. The morning after the beer incident was like waking up to the aftermath of a storm. The house was silent, a stark contrast to the usual hum of activity. As I made my way to the kitchen, the memory of last night's humiliation clung to me like a second skin. But today, I refused to let it define me. I found Meredith at the stove, her back turned to me, the air around her thick with the scent of brewing coffee. Good morning, I said, my voice stronger than I felt. Without turning, Meredith replied, Coffee's almost ready. Her tone was neutral, as if last night had never happened. I poured myself a cup, the silence between us stretching uncomfortably. It was then Tristan walked in, his eyes barely meeting mine as he mumbled a good morning. The tension was palpable, a silent battle of wills taking place in the heart of our home. I wanted to scream, to shout, to make them see how their actions were tearing us apart. But I knew it would only fall on deaf ears. Eliza! About last night, Tristan began, his voice trailing off as he searched for the right words. I cut him off, my patience worn thin. Save it, Tristan. Your apologies mean nothing if your actions don't change. Meredith finally turned, her gaze sharp. Eliza, don't talk to your husband that way. He's trying to apologize. Her words stung, a painful reminder of the chasm between us. An apology doesn't undo the disrespect, Meredith. Or do you think it's acceptable for a husband to treat his wife like that? Meredith's lips tightened into a thin line, her silence speaking volumes. The conversation was cut short by Douglas's entrance. His disapproving glance at Tristan was a small comfort, a sign that not everyone was blind to the injustices unfolding within these walls. 
Breakfast passed in silence, each of us lost in our own thoughts. It was a silence that screamed of broken bonds and unspoken resentments. The rest of the day passed in a blur of chores and strained interactions. It was during these moments of solitude that I allowed myself to reflect on my journey to this point. Once I had been full of dreams and ambitions, a young girl with the world at her feet. But somewhere along the way, I had lost myself in the role of the dutiful wife, my dreams sidelined by the needs of others. It was in these moments of reflection that the seeds of resentment began to grow, watered by the constant belittlement and disregard from Tristan and Meredith. Their words, meant to cut deep, only fueled my resolve to reclaim my independence, to prove that I was more than just an extension of their expectations. The day ended as it had begun, with a heavy silence hanging over the house. As I lay in bed next to Tristan, the distance between us felt insurmountable. I realized that the man lying next to me was a stranger, his once endearing quirks now sources of endless frustration. It was clear that something had to change. I could no longer continue living in the shadow of the person I used to be. The humiliation and disrespect had reached a boiling point, and I knew that if I didn't take action, I would be consumed by the bitterness that threatened to overwhelm me. As the night gave way to the early hours of the morning, a plan began to form in my mind. A plan to break free from the chains of this toxic environment, to take back control of my life. It was a daunting task, one that would require all the strength and determination I could muster. But as I drifted off to sleep, I knew it was the only way forward. The path to redemption was fraught with challenges, but I was ready to face them head-on, ready to fight for the future I deserved. The days that followed were a testament to the growing divide within our household. My role had shifted subtly yet significantly from partner to caretaker, not just of the home but increasingly of Douglas, whose health had begun to falter. This new responsibility was not one I shied away from. If anything, it provided a sense of purpose amidst the chaos. Douglas, you need to eat something, I urged gently, presenting a plate of food to him. His once robust frame had become frail, a shadow of the man who had once commanded respect without uttering a word. I'm not hungry, Eliza, but thank you, he replied, his voice weak but laced with gratitude. As I cared for Douglas, the criticism from Tristan and Meredith intensified, their barbs more pointed and frequent. You're smothering him, Tristan would snap, watching with a critical eye as I helped his father navigate the stairs or take his medication. Meredith was no kinder. You act like you're the only one who cares about him, she accused, her words dripping with disdain as she observed my attempts to make Douglas comfortable. Their cruelty was unrelenting, but my resolve to stand my ground did not waver. Amidst their contempt, a bond had formed between Douglas and me, forged in the quiet moments of care and understanding. It was during these times that Douglas would share stories of Tristan's childhood, painting a picture of a boy who had never faced consequences, his every whim indulged by Meredith's unwavering defense. It wasn't always like this, Douglas confided one afternoon, a hint of sadness in his eyes. But we let things go too far. Meredith couldn't bear to see him upset. I listened, the pieces of the puzzle falling into place, explaining the man Tristan had become. Despite the harsh reality of our situation, I found solace in Douglas's company, his wisdom a guiding light in the darkness that had enveloped our home. The tension reached a boiling point one evening, when a simple misunderstanding turned into a full-blown confrontation. In my haste to prepare dinner while attending to Douglas, I accidentally knocked over a glass of wine, staining the tablecloth Meredith cherished. That's irreplaceable! Meredith shrieked, her face contorted with rage as she surveyed the damage. It was an accident, Meredith. I'll clean it up, I offered, reaching for a cloth, but Tristan blocked my path. No, let her see what her carelessness has cost he sneered, his voice cold and unforgiving. The room fell silent, the air thick with unspoken words and pent-up frustration. Douglas attempted to mediate, his voice a calming presence amidst the storm. It's just a tablecloth. Let's not let this ruin our evening. But his words were like a match to kindling, igniting a firestorm of accusations and blame that left no one unscathed. Tristan and Meredith stood united in their disdain, their words cutting deeper than any physical wound could. That night, as I lay awake, 
the events of the evening replaying in my mind, I realized that my presence in this house was not just a burden to them. It was a mirror, reflecting their own failings and insecurities. The hostility I faced was a testament to their inability to confront the truth about themselves and their son. The bond I shared with Douglas, however, offered a glimmer of hope in the midst of despair. His appreciation for my care was a balm to the wounds inflicted by Tristan and Meredith's cruelty. It was this connection that sustained me, a reminder that kindness and understanding could still flourish even in the most toxic environments. As the days passed, my determination to rise above the hostility only grew stronger. The path ahead was fraught with obstacles, but I was no longer the woman who had walked into this house, meek and compliant. The fire within me had been ignited, fueled by injustice and cruelty, and I was ready to fight back, to claim the respect and dignity that was rightfully mine. The simmering discontent had reached its boiling point, and I knew that the time for action was drawing near. The atmosphere in the house grew heavier with each passing day, a storm cloud ready to burst. Despite the constant tension, I continued to navigate the choppy waters of our household dynamics, my resolve to maintain peace never waning. But as hard as I tried, the balance I sought seemed ever out of reach, the scales tipped too far by Tristan and Meredith's antagonism. It was during a particularly fraught dinner that the delicate balance we'd managed to uphold came crashing down. I had spent the afternoon preparing a meal— hoping to bring some semblance of normalcy to our fractured family. But as fate would have it, a simple mishap would serve as the catalyst for the evening's downfall. As I carried the dish to the table, my foot caught on the edge of the rug, sending me stumbling forward. The meal I had labored over landed in a heap on the floor, my efforts wasted. Clumsy as ever, Tristan remarked with a sneer, his words cutting through the silence that followed my fall. Meredith's laughter echoed his contempt, her gaze upon me void of sympathy. You can't do anything right, can you? Douglas, ever the peacemaker, rose to my defense. It was an accident. Eliza, are you all right? But his concern was drowned out by the cacophony of blame and mockery from Tristan and Meredith. Their harsh words felt like physical blows, each one a reminder of the precarious position I held within this family. As I cleaned up the mess— the weight of their disdain pressing down on me, I couldn't help but wonder how much more I could endure. The incident at dinner was not an isolated one. It was a symptom of a much larger issue, a manifestation of the disrespect and malice that had become all too common. In the days that followed, Douglas attempted to mediate the growing rift between us. We need to find a way to live together in peace, he pleaded, his voice weary from the constant conflict but his efforts were met with resistance. Tristan and Meredith, united in their disdain for me, refused to see the part they played in the household's discord. Their blame was always directed outward, never inward. The tension reached a boiling point one evening, when Tristan's cruelty took on a new form. Returning home late, he barged into the living room where I sat reading, his eyes alight with malice. "'I suppose you've been lounging around all day, while the rest of us work.' he accused, his words laced with venom. "'I've been taking care of your father,' I replied, my voice steady despite the anger boiling within me. Tristan's laugh was cold, devoid of humor. "'My father doesn't need a nursemaid. He needs a family that doesn't include a freeloader.' The insult stung, a bitter reminder of how low Tristan's opinion of me had sunk, but it also ignited a spark of defiance within me, a determination to no longer accept his abuse in silence." Maybe if you showed a fraction of the concern for your father that I do, you'd understand the meaning of family, I shot back, my words a reflection of the frustration and hurt I had kept bottled up for too long. Tristan's response was a glare filled with hatred, a silent promise of further conflict. But in that moment I realized that I no longer feared his anger. The scales had tipped, and with them, my tolerance for the indignities I had suffered at the hands of Tristan and Meredith— as I went to bed that night, the events of the day replayed in my mind. The precarious balance we had maintained had been shattered, the pieces too scattered to ever be put back together. The path ahead was uncertain, fraught with challenges and confrontation. But one thing was clear. I could no longer stand idly by while Tristan and Meredith sought to diminish me. The time had come to take a stand, 
to fight back against the injustice that had become my daily reality. The battle lines were drawn, and though the road ahead was daunting, I was ready. Ready to reclaim my dignity, to assert my worth, and to fight for the respect I deserved. The storm that had been brewing was about to break, and I was no longer afraid to face it head on. The days melded into one another, each bringing its own set of challenges and confrontations, but nothing could have prepared me for the events that would ultimately serve as the catalyst for my transformation. It began like any other day, with the morning light creeping through the curtains and the house stirring to life, but the air was charged with a tension that hinted at the storm on the horizon. Breakfast was a silent affair, the clinking of cutlery against plates the only sound breaking the uneasy quiet. Tristan and Meredith exchanged glances, their silent communication a language I had grown all too familiar with. Douglas, sensing the brewing storm, cast me a worried look, his concern a balm to my frayed nerves. It was not until later that morning that the dam finally broke. Tristan, emboldened by whatever grievance he had concocted in his mind, launched into an unprovoked tirade against me. "'This is all your fault!' he bellowed, his finger pointed accusingly in my direction. You've turned my own parents against me. His words were absurd, a distortion of reality that bore no truth, but they were spoken with a conviction that belied their falsehood. I've done nothing but support you and your family, I countered, my voice firm despite the shaking of my hands. Support? You call this support? Tristan's laugh was bitter, filled with contempt. You've done nothing but bring discord into this house— Meredith, ever Tristan's ally, nodded in agreement. You've overstayed your welcome, Eliza. It's time you realized that. The words were a slap in the face, a stark reminder of my precarious position within this family. But it was Douglas's response that marked the turning point. Enough! His voice, though weakened by illness, carried the weight of authority it once had. Tristan, your behavior is unacceptable. Apologize to Eliza now. The room fell silent the air thick with unspoken words and suppressed emotions. Tristan, faced with his father's rare admonishment, faltered. His face flushed with anger. He stormed out of the room, the slam of the door echoing like a gunshot. In the aftermath of Tristan's outburst, the reality of my situation became painfully clear. The family I had tried so hard to support to be a part of was irrevocably broken. And I, caught in the middle, had become the scapegoat for their frustrations and failings. Douglas's attempt to defend me, though heartening, was a stark reminder of the divisions that had formed. His words, though intended to mend, only served to widen the chasm between us. As I retreated to the sanctuary of my room, the events of the morning replaying in my mind, a resolve began to take shape. The humiliation and disrespect I had endured could no longer be brushed aside. It was time to take a stand, to fight back against the injustice that had become a constant in my life. The decision to leave, to extricate myself from this toxic environment, was not made lightly. But as I packed my belongings, each item a reminder of the life I had hoped to build here, I knew it was the only way forward. The confrontation with Tristan, the culmination of years of tension and resentment, was the last straw. It had shattered any illusions of reconciliation, of finding a place within this family. My path, once entwined with theirs, had diverged leading me away from the pain and toward a future of my own making. As I closed the door behind me, the weight of my decision pressing down on me, I felt not sorrow, but a sense of liberation. The journey ahead would be fraught with challenges, but for the first time in a long time, I felt ready to face them. Ready to reclaim my independence. To forge a new path, based on respect and dignity. The chapter of my life entangled with Tristan and his family had come to a close, but as I stepped into the unknown, I did so with a newfound strength and determination. The battle may have been lost, but the war was far from over, and I, Eliza, was ready to fight for the life I deserved. The night air was cool against my skin as I walked away from the house that had been my prison for too long. The darkness seemed less daunting than the life I was leaving behind. My steps were uncertain, yet driven by a force stronger than fear, the desire for freedom and a fresh start. As I navigated the quiet streets, my phone vibrated in my pocket, pulling me back to the reality I was trying to escape. It was a message from a number I didn't recognize, but the content left 
no room for doubt about the sender. Running away won't solve your problems, Eliza. You'll regret this. Tristan's words, even in text form, dripped with venom and the promise of retaliation. I quickened my pace, the threat igniting a spark of defiance within me. Tristan's attempts to intimidate me, to drag me back into the mire of his making, would not sway my resolve. I was done being a victim of his cruelty. The following day, the repercussions of my departure became apparent. News of Tristan's latest escapade, a drunken brawl at a local bar, spread through our small community like wildfire. The incident, which ended with his arrest, was the talk of the town, a public humiliation that laid bare the depths of his recklessness. I learned of the incident through hushed conversations at the café where I sought refuge, the whispers of the patrons a mixture of pity and schadenfreude. Did you hear about Tristan? Completely lost it last night. They had to call the police, one woman said, her voice laced with a mix of shock and morbid fascination. The news, while shocking, was not surprising. Tristan's self-destructive behavior was a path he had chosen long ago, each act of defiance against decency and responsibility leading him inevitably to this point. But it was Douglas's reaction, conveyed to me through a brief, heart-wrenching phone call, that struck the deepest chord. "'Eliza, I'm sorry. I never wanted it to come to this,' he said, his voice a reflection of his shattered hopes for his son. The conversation was brief, the pain and disappointment palpable even through the phone line. Douglas's acknowledgment of Tristan's failings and his apology to me was a bittersweet vindication of my decision to leave. The fallout from Tristan's actions was swift and severe. His arrest and the subsequent legal troubles served as a form of instant karma, a reckoning for years of unchecked behavior. But while part of me felt vindicated, another part ached for Douglas who bore the brunt of his son's disgrace. In the days that followed, my resolve to start anew was tested. The temptation to return, to offer support to Douglas in his time of need, was a constant battle. But I knew that going back would mean surrendering the hard-won ground I had gained in my fight for independence. As I struggled with my conscience, a chance encounter provided the clarity I needed. A former colleague, unaware of my personal turmoil, reached out with an opportunity that promised not just a new career, but a fresh start in a new city. The offer was a lifeline, a chance to escape the shadows of the past and build a future on my own terms. It was the sign I had been waiting for, the confirmation that my decision to leave was not just right, but necessary. With a heart heavy with mixed emotions, but a spirit buoyed by the prospect of a new beginning, I made my choice. The path ahead was fraught with uncertainty, but it was mine to walk, free from the chains of a toxic marriage and the specter of Tristan's downfall. As I packed my bags, ready to embark on this new journey, I realized that the night of repercussions was not just the end of one chapter, but the beginning of another. The drama and revenge that had marked my days with Tristan were behind me now, replaced by a sense of hope and the promise of redemption. The road ahead was long, and the wounds of the past would take time to heal. But as I stepped into the dawn of a new day, I did so with the knowledge that I was no longer defined by the failures of others. I was Eliza, strong, independent, and free at last. The new city welcomed me with open arms, its bustling streets and vibrant energy, a stark contrast to the life I had left behind. Here, in this place of new beginnings, I found the strength to rebuild, to carve out a space for myself that was untouched by the shadow of my past. But even as I embraced this fresh start, the specter of unfinished business loomed over me, a reminder that true freedom required confronting the demons I had fled. It was during this period of renewal that I received an unexpected call, one that would set the stage for the final act of my departure from Tristan's life. The voice on the other end was familiar, yet fraught with a desperation I had never heard before. Eliza, it's Meredith. You need to come back. Tristan's in trouble, and he needs you. Her plea, laced with manipulation, was a tactic I had grown all too familiar with. I'm not coming back, Meredith. Tristan's problems are his own making. He needs to face the consequences of his actions, I replied, my voice steady, a reflection of my newfound resolve. But he's your husband. Meredith's voice cracked, the veneer of control giving way to panic. He was my husband. That's in the past now. With those words, I ended the call, 
cutting the final thread that tied me to the life I once shared with Tristan. The news of Tristan's legal troubles had not gone unnoticed by me. His actions, once merely reckless, had spiraled into criminality, leaving a trail of destruction in his wake. It was a path that could only end in ruin, and I refused to be dragged down with him. In the wake of my decision, I took proactive steps to protect myself and ensure that Tristan would be held accountable for his actions. With the help of a skilled attorney, I began to compile evidence of Tristan's misdeeds, documents, and testimonies that painted a damning picture of the man I had once vowed to stand by. The process was grueling, a dredging up of memories I had fought hard to bury. But with each piece of evidence I gathered, I felt a weight lifting from my shoulders, a sense of empowerment that came from taking control of my narrative. As the case against Tristan began to take shape, an unlikely ally emerged. Douglas, disillusioned by his son's behavior and Meredith's denial, reached out to me with an offer of support. "'Eliza, I can't undo the past, but I want to help make things right,' he said, his voice heavy with regret. Douglas's support was a turning point, a sign that justice, though long delayed, was finally within reach. Together, we presented a united front, a testament to the fact that Tristan's actions could no longer be swept under the rug. The legal battle that ensued was a public spectacle, a fall from grace that stripped Tristan of his ability to harm those around him. The evidence we had gathered was irrefutable, leading to a conviction that would see Tristan facing the consequences of his actions for years to come. As I stood outside the courthouse, the final verdict ringing in my ears, I felt a mixture of relief and sorrow. Relief that the ordeal was over, and sorrow for the family that had been irrevocably broken by one man's selfishness. The journey to this point had been fraught with pain and hardship. But as I looked to the future, I did so with a heart unburdened by the past. The revenge I had sought was not one of malice, but of justice, a reclaiming of my dignity and a declaration that I would no longer be a victim. The turning point had come and gone leaving in its wake a path to a new life, one filled with hope and the promise of healing. And as I walked away from the courthouse that day, I knew that the next chapter of my story would be written on my terms, free from the shadows of yesterday. The courtroom's heavy doors closed behind me with a finality that echoed through my very core. The legal battle was over, and with it a chapter of my life that had been marked by struggle and pain. The city around me bustled with life, indifferent to the monumental shift that had just occurred within those courtroom walls. Yet, for me, the world seemed for it now, colored by the promise of new beginnings and the sweet, hard-won taste of freedom. In the days that followed, I found myself walking the streets of my new city with a lighter step, each day unwrapping itself like a gift. The job that had once seemed like a mere escape now flourished into a promising career. My efforts acknowledged, and my talents nurtured. It was in this environment of support and respect that I rediscovered my passion and purpose, the dark cloud of my past slowly receding into the background. But it wasn't just my professional life that had undergone a transformation. The solitude that had once been my constant companion was gradually replaced by a network of friends and colleagues, relationships built on mutual respect and shared experiences. It was during one such gathering, a casual dinner with friends, that I met Alex. Alex's entrance into my life was unassuming, a slow burn that gradually evolved into something deep and meaningful. Our conversations flowed effortlessly, a dance of words and laughter that filled the spaces in my heart I hadn't realized were empty. With Alex, I found not just love, but a partnership built on trust, understanding, and an unwavering support that I had once thought impossible to find. As my relationship with Alex grew, so too did my sense of self. The insecurities and fears that had once held sway over me began to fade, replaced by a confidence and strength that I wore like a mantle. I was no longer the woman who had walked away from Tristan and his toxic influence. I was someone new, someone reborn from the ashes of my past. Yet, even as I embraced this new chapter, I, I couldn't help reflect on the journey that had brought me here. The fight for justice against Tristan had been arduous, a battle that had tested my limits and forced me to confront the darkest parts of my soul. But it was a battle I had won, not just in the courtroom, but within myself. 
The karmic justice that had befallen Tristan was a distant memory, a chapter closed and locked away. Meredith's attempts to reach out, to bridge the chasm that had formed between us, were met with polite indifference. The family I had once longed to be a part of was now just a footnote in my story, a reminder of the trials I had overcome. As for Douglas, our relationship had evolved into one of mutual respect and understanding. His support during the trial had been a beacon of hope, a reminder that not all was lost in the wake of Tristan's destruction. We remained in contact, a tentative connection that served as a testament to our shared history and the resilience of the human spirit. The new dawn that had risen on the horizon of my life was bright with possibility, its light casting long shadows over the remnants of my past. I had emerged from the crucible of my experiences a stronger, more resilient person, ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. And as I stood on the balcony of my new apartment, the city sprawling before me, I realized that this was not just a new chapter, but a whole new book waiting to be written. My story, once defined by drama and revenge, was now a tale of triumph and renewal, a narrative of my own making. With Alex by my side and a future unburdened by the past stretching out before us, I knew that anything was possible. The pain and turmoil that had once defined my existence were now just echoes, faint reminders of how far I had come. This was my new dawn, my chance to live a life defined not by what I had endured, but by what I had overcome. And as the sun dipped below the horizon, casting the sky in shades of pink and gold, I knew that I was finally home.